So this week, uh, with the shortened week, we're going to be talking about chapter nine today. Um, I think we will probably get through chapter nine. And then on Wednesday, I will probably just have everybody do the discussion board independently um, uh, for Wednesday's class session, because that's all I have on the docket. Unless if we need a little extra time, then maybe I'll make a video recording the rest of chapter nine if needed for people to watch. But that way, if people are traveling or dealing with weather or whatever. You have the option of not having to worry about it on Wednesday, because I think a lot of people are kind of worrying about driving and stuff. So um, I'm just going to close the door here one second. Okay, so I will go ahead. I'm going to chat about chapter nine. This chapter is going to be on the production cycle and auditing inventory. So looking at um, transformation of products into inventory. Um, so raw, uh, raw materials into finished inventory, the selling of that inventory and charging off to cost of goods sold are, are kind of the key aspects here. So we already kind of talked about the revenue side. Now we're mostly just talking about the inventory and cost of goods sold portion. Um, so learning objectives, we're going to talk about source documents, relevant assertions, um, material, potential for material misstatement, talk about tests of controls related to inventory, um, and then some different audit procedures that might apply for this area. So um, the three big uh, uh, activities in the organization that we list below, um, there's the acquisition cycle where we are making purchases. Um, we talked about those in a prior chapter. The production cycle, um, is what we're looking at now, which is where we are going to be um, creating the goods and services that we would be selling to our customers. And then the revenue cycle, which we've already looked at, is where we are selling those goods and collecting the cash related to that. And then all of those interact with payroll, administration, financing, and general accounting um, at every step of the way. But we talked about payroll a little bit more in chapter eight. So moving on, um, we have a flow chart here that talks about um, the different documents and activities that are going on in the uh, production cycle. So the whole process starts out with production planning. The company has to come up with a sales forecast for what they think they're going to sell, which you probably would have talked about in uh, quite a bit in managerial and cost accounting. Um, they create these sales forecasts so that they know how much they need to produce. Um, and then once they've come up with um, the amount that they want to produce, then they would look at their raw materials listing, their existing supply of raw materials, and then determine what they would need to purchase in order to make the goods that would be required for uh, what they need to sell. And with the ideal outcome being that they would have um, just a little bit left over at the end of this production cycle after they sell what they think they're going to sell. So they'd have enough inventory to hold them through to the next um, planning and production cycle, but without having so much that they're going to incur excess inventory costs or um, have things become obsolete or unsellable. So once they've done that, um, they're going to have the production planning, they're going to look at inventory planning, how much inventory do we need for the level of production that we have, and then they are going to actually be producing goods and services. So going into that production of goods and services, there's going to be wages going on, there's going to be uh, sales of goods and services uh, with delivery to customers, changes, inventory being created, inventory being sold. Um, and then um, down here, we see a lot of uh, documents related to this. We've got bills of materials, so lists of materials that are going to be needed for certain amounts of production. Um, the inventory plan, production plan, sales forecast are all part of this. And those are going to uh, be used to create production orders. So we're going to say, all right, now we need to produce this many units. We're producing those. Throughout this production cycle, we're going to be doing quality control tests to make sure that things are not being wasted. Um, we're gonna be taking periodic physical counts of inventory to make sure that we're producing what we expect and that we still have the inventory that we expect to have based on what we've produced and what we've sold. 
We're going to be analyzing our costs to make sure that we are um, efficiently achieving our production without waste. Um, or if there's unexpected costs, how, how and why are those being generated? Um, and how do we need to change our plan? Say, if um, is the increase in cost due to waste or is it due to increased prices for materials? Those would be handled in two totally different ways. Um, and then we'd be looking at production reports showing um, what was our cost, and that would be used um, in that production cost analysis. Anything that we have for long-term assets that are associated with production would get depreciated, um, and we'd be updating those depreciation records. And then we would, uh, when we sell our goods, Afterwards, we're going to be charging them off to cost of goods sold based on our chosen method of inventory management, whether it's like FIFO, LIFO, et cetera. And then at the end, um, we're going to have inventory counts. We're going to reconcile them to what we started with, what we produced, what we sold, and what we had at the end. Um, and then the production cycle just, this operates continually. Like they make it sound like you go through a loop and then you start again, but all of these activities are continuously going on at the same time throughout production. So management's activities, they're going to be producing the sales forecasts and using those to plan the production amount, like how many units are we making and what materials are we going to need. Um, and then they're also going to be um, looking at inventory control. So they need to come up with the policies and procedures that are going to make sure that we aren't producing too much inventory, that we're not producing too little inventory, and that we're also taking good care of the inventory that we have. Um, they would use some documents. The production order it would be um, uh, what would be used for planning the production. Materials requisitions would be used in making the purchases of necessary materials. And the materials transfer tickets would transfer um, goods into production out of inventory. And then as you have items that are moving from one stage of production to the next, those materials transfer tickets will also move them through various phases of production and then track where things are. Um, and then, of course, now that would typically be um, a computerized uh, materials transfer ticket showing that things have been completed in this particular stage and moved to the next stage. They will rarely be um, a paper ticket uh, uh, in, unless you have a smaller production line. And then cost accounting means that you're going to be looking at, um, you're going to know in general, what the standard cost is uh, expected to be, um, you're going to allocate charges off to overhead and make sure that those are accounted for. So what are the relevant assertions when you are auditing inventory? Well, key is existence. So if we say that we have inventory, does that inventory actually exist? Do we have the inventory sitting in our storage warehouses that we say we have? Um, is the inventory record complete? So is everything that's sitting in inventory properly accounted for um, and updated? Um, cut off were things moved into and out of inventory during the correct time periods? Is the inventory properly valued or do we have a bunch of obsolete worthless inventory that's sitting there on the books showing that um, maybe we have 100 television sets um, like Crazy Eddie sitting in our inventory? but maybe they're all broken or maybe they're all um, obsolete old technology that nobody wants anymore. Um, um, do we own the inventory that we have or has it been shipped to us on consignment? That's a uh, That would be under the topic of rights. And then presentation and disclosures, just are we reporting that properly based on the inventory methodologies that we have adopted? Now, as far as cost of goods sold, completeness is a concern. So are all of the items that were sold being properly transferred into cost of goods sold, or are we failing to make those transfers out of inventory and into cost of goods sold? And then also accuracy, um, are the amounts accurately accounted for? So those are all the relevant assertions that we'd be looking at. Now, um, as far as the risk of material misstatement goes um, with inventory, um, some of the things that can go wrong would be including things in inventory um, that were not actually in inventory on the balance sheet date. So thing, having things that in there that don't exist or having them in there before or after they were moved in or out of inventory. So that would be cut off. 
Um, have all inventory items been included? So is everything in the warehouse included in our inventory? That's completeness. Um, valuation would be proper valuation under GAAP. Um, do we own them? So a lot of these I already kind of discussed. I'm not going to repeat them, but um, um, under accuracy, making sure that everything's properly recorded and presented based on the rules under GAAP is sort of a key aspect there. Okay, so this sort of divide, that was uh, inventory. Um, as far as cost of goods sold uh, wasn't really included on there. They were primarily talking about inventory. So I'm gonna mention these two items down here. Um, with cost of goods sold, you could have laborers or materials that were omitted from your production costs. So um, there was additional labor or material that was utilized but not recorded um, and not expensed to cost of goods sold. Um, or you could just record things wrong, like um, miscalculate the amount of uh, raw materials or labor that were used. All right, so what are the internal control activities that we would need to have and how would we design those? How would we evaluate whether the internal control activities were adequate based on what was needed for the entity? Um, so all of these controls are entity level controls, like they need to be um, standardized across the organization um, based on that company's individual risks and situation. And some of the considerations are, okay, there has to be an authorization for production run. Well, why would we care? Like if, if, if everybody knows that it needs to be done, then why would we need specific authorization? Well, because people want to work overtime and say um, supervisors on the line and the workers would make overtime if they worked extra hours. They might be like, hey, let's just put in an extra hour and do this more and we can get paid overtime. Well, it's not efficient. You're paying people at time and a half or uh, double time, depending on what the contract would be. Um, so completing additional production beyond what is authorized, um, then you might have too much inventory that you don't need. Um, you could potentially result in wastage if you have things that are um, that could go to waste um, if they aren't used within a certain amount of time. So like if you have a bakery, you don't want your people baking extra stuff um, that can't be sold or that hasn't been ordered because it could be spoiled or wasted at the end of the day. So there needs to be some authorization for production runs. The other possibilities, if you have people producing things that are not supposed to be produced, that they could be more easily misappropriated without being tracked. So you don't want people to be able to um, do excess production without there being some type of oversight and tracking for everything that is uh, being created. Uh, raw materials should be counted and inspected. So counted meaning um, make sure they're there, inspected to make sure that what you think you have is what you actually have. I saw an article um, not too long ago that some bank or investment group over in Europe thought they had a whole bunch, they thought they had like 100,000 bags, uh, like half ton bags of nickel ore. So like the metal nickel. And um, it was sitting in a warehouse somewhere in Europe, and they had somebody go and do an uh, inspection, and they realized they just had like, <laughs> they just had a whole bunch of bags of plain rocks. <laughs> somebody had um, swapped out, either they when they purchased it, they didn't actually get nickel ore, or somebody did a heist and swapped it out. But uh, what they thought was like a million dollars worth of nickel was actually just like a bunch of class five gravel, essentially. So. Um, they need to be inspected, not just counted. Like you can't just look at the bags. Somebody's got to look at the bags. Who knows what's in the bags and make sure what's in the bags is supposed to be in the bags. Um, when production is undertaken, material and labor qual uh, quantities should be summarized and tracked. And then um, you have to track what goes into production, what gets scrapped. So if you have something that's not good, it gets broken. You need to keep track of that so you can figure out if you have you know, what amount is going to scrap? Is the amount that we're sending to scrap reasonable? Or are people using scrap to steal perfectly legitimate inventory or raw materials inventory and resell it um, and then writing it off to scrap um, and misappropriating assets? So all of these things need to get um, approved, signed off on, and accounted for. 
Um, production labor reports should be approved and reconciled with along with the payroll. So um, that makes sense because you probably have some controls already set up for payroll. So you can put the production labor reports hand in hand with that. Separation of duties because the people doing the payroll are not going to be the same people doing the production. And then that way they can track and make sure that everything gets charged off as far as labor to the correct areas. Um, so that's a, a way of making that whole process more efficient. Finished goods inventory production records need to be reviewed by the production supervisor and forwarded to the accountant so that they actually get recorded. And then periodically there need to be counts and inspection of items to compare what is in the inventory record with what is actually there to make sure that things aren't disappearing in between um, uh, at the time. Now, um, cost accounting, they're going to look at the quantity of raw materials that are uh, that are there based on what has been requisitioned. So are we ordering excess raw materials and then ending up with just the right amount at the end? If so, where are the raw materials going? Um, looking at the direct labor on the timesheets and the labor distribution report, do those jive with each other? Um, or do we have excess labor costs? Are people timing in for extra hours when they aren't actually working? Um, and then cost accounting department is going to apply overhead costs to the production cycle based on um, tickets of production to arrive at a cost summary of actual costs that should be charged to the inventory. Um, custody is an issue. There should always be somebody who is in charge of keeping track of the inventory and having custody of that. Um, so like logging things in, logging things out, inventory doesn't get moved around without it being logged as being moved from point A to point B. Um, and then you can use an internal uh, control questionnaire in order to um, document the way that these processes should be. Um, they can use that internally. The auditors can also use it as well, um, just to confirm that the internal controls that are supposed to be in place are actually being utilized. All right, so this just basically summarizes all of that. Um, So um, looking at operating effectiveness of internal control for inventory. All right. So um, inventory control. So the inventory areas should be secure and locked down. Nobody can just like walk in and out of the inventory areas because you could pocket stuff or find ways of moving things in and out um, when you didn't actually have permission to do so. So how would you test that? Um, you'd observe that the inventory was locked and that there are functioning cameras. So they can see and that there's a some type of system for tracking, um, whether it's through cameras or electronic logins, whether people have gone in and out, who and how long they were in there for. Um, transfers of inventory need to be authorized. So you need to see documentation of appropriate authorization of inventory transfers from one area to the next. This would be an area where you could like potentially do some attributes sampling of the production cycle, where you can say, hey, I'm gonna follow this production run and I'm gonna check off, was the production approved? Was the transfer of inventory approved? Was um, it logged from one area of production into the other area of production? Was it properly signed off on by the production manager at the end. So these notice these are all yes or no questions. Did these controls function? Um, and then when they get to the end, was this properly forwarded to the accounting system to record it into inventory? When it was sold, was it properly transferred from inventory into cost of goods sold? So you could follow something all the way through um, to do those tests of internal controls. Um, and then uh, Checking for periodic physical counts. What is the documentation of the periodic inventory count? Who took it? What were their qualifications? What degree of testing was performed? Um, were there any discrepancies found, et cetera? Now, as far as completeness, um, the control activity that material requisitions are numbered sequentially and reconciled. Um, if this is an electronic system or a paper system, either way, you can look and see if there are gaps in the sequence and evidence that they have tracked and reconciled the numeric sequence to make sure that everything is kept track of. Same thing with the receiving reports. They should be pre-numbered, used in sequence, and reconciled daily. Um, so you could inspect those reconciliations as well. Now, um, for valuation, 
Management should be reviewing what is charged off as inventory costs for uh, to make sure that it's reasonable. Um, cost sheets should be getting reviewed for pro for projects and projection runs by management and or supervisors to make sure. And there should be documentation that they were signed off on. And you should be able to trace costs from the cost sheets associated with different jobs to the supporting documentation for why those costs were incurred. Um, inventory items are periodically re uh, looked at for usability. So uh, things that are obsolete are being written off and therefore they are making sure that the inventory that they have uh, on the books is actually valuable inventory. And then um, separate accounts are used to track inventory on consignment. So they're not grouping inventory that they don't own with inventory that they do own. How do they track what happens to anything that comes in on, on consignment. There won't always be consignment, but if there is, that would be just a question. Do you have consignment? Okay, let's talk about how does that get tracked and uh, verify some documentation of how you keep things separate uh, for consignment inventory versus inventory that the company owns. Now, as far as presentation and disclosure, they should have a checklist that they um, complete prior to financial statements. Um, auditors will have that same checklist that they'll be using to review to make sure that it's all recorded correctly. Um, and then they will review all the financial statement disclosures to say, make sure that they make sense and that uh, management has made their representation that the ac amounts are accurate. Um, for cost sheets, they get reviewed for production runs, inspected by management. Um, a lot of these actually I have kind of looked at. Um, let's see, you can vouch uh, bills of materials and labor to job cost sheets for inclusion of relevant costs. All right, now what are some risks that are specific to the production cycle? All right, so um, looking at uh, what we go back to are the assertions that we're testing here and what are the um, risks that are tied to those assertions, all right? So as far as occurrence, um, um, actually, I've kind of talked about this. This is just sort of a summary of different things we've already talked through. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but this is a good review sheet that sort of summarizes all of the uh, assertions and internal controls and tests here. So looking at um, audit control tests, looking at evidence of reconciliations, looking at journal entries that are made to make sure that they tie out to cost sheets and have proper documentation, um, looking at the inventory counts, um, looking at the reconciliation of inventory counts with records, um, and uh, looking for supervisor signatures at appropriate phases. All right, so here's a test of production controls looking for completeness, all right? So um, you're gonna come up with a production order. That's gonna be your sample for testing for completeness. You are going to match your production order to a bill of materials and, and personnel uh, bill of labor needs. You're gonna match those out, all right? To make sure that they match with your production order. You're also going to um, trace from your production order to the materials use reports, the production uh, cost reports, and the issuance slips. And then you're also going to trace from your production order out to your labor reports and production cost reports to make sure that those match. And then you're also going to check for um, that initial authorization. Now, looking at occurrence, again, starting with a production cost report, you're gonna vouch the materials out to the materials reports. You're going to compare the materials used to the materials requisitions. Um, you can vouch that the labor that was used out to the labor reports. You can vouch the overhead that was charged out to the overhead analysis. This should actually be over here. And then you can compare the labor to the inventory or the ledger accounts. So general ledger inventory accounts and see what uh, labor was charged out to inventory. And then you can recalculate um, what you think you should be seeing um, based on. Um, so you could start with your sample, recalculate what you think you should be seeing for labor overhead and materials, and then um, vouch those out to make sure that the amounts that were used and that were charged off in the accounting system makes sense. 
Okay. So as far as substantive procedures, um, you could observe your client's physical inventory account and ensure that items were counted. This is very common. If you have an inventory intensive organization, um, some audit uh, intern and or first or second year auditors are probably going to get sent out on the first day of the financial statement date of the following year to count what's sitting there in inventory going into the new year. Um, so, uh, and they'll just go out there and participate in the client doing their inventory accounts, oversee it to make sure that everything makes sense and what they're seeing is there. Um, and then they might uh, perform some of their own separate inventory tests, like saying, hey, you say you have this many um, pallets of this particular material. Let's go look at all those pallets. They'll count all the pallets and say, yep, that looks great. Maybe they'll do a number of tests. They'll figure out based on the amount of inventory the client has, dollar value, et cetera, what different tests do I need to look at? That'll get figured out in advance and then they'll show up and run those counts um, on the uh, at the end of the year there. And then they'll also perform purchase cutoff tests, looking at the um, records of what came in and what came out based on the inventory logs, as well as the billing and um, invoices that were received for inventory. Okay, so looking at cost averages, they could recalculate expected percentage cost of goods sold. Um, they could trace inventory costs to standard expected costs and Inqu make inquiries regarding obsolete inventory. Um, they could, if they're worried about it, they could perform lower of cost or net realizable value tests, which you learned about in uh, intermediate accounting. And then talking about uh, with management about whether any inventory is not owned by the company, um, if indeed it is um, uh, consignment inventory. So lots of talking here. Sorry about that. Um, looking at um, effective or let's see other substantive procedures here. Um, is in is any inventory pledged as collateral or security for loans? Um, if so, then they would need to perform bank and loan confirmations on those amounts. Um, that would uh, potentially be disclosures. Uh, they would need to disclose if any of their inventory is being held as collateral. Um, and then looking at proper classification of inventories as far as whether it's raw materials, work in process and finished goods. Okay, and I've talked about those. Now, uh, what happens when you are doing a client count? So I said, hey, you might go out and observe. Um, you're gonna probably have, you're gonna have names or teams that you're working with, specific dates. You're gonna have instructions for exactly what you're gonna be looking for and what type of counts you're gonna have. You're gonna note anything that looks obsolete or damaged that is discovered during the counts. Um, inventory tag control, um, they'll have an inventory count sheet where they will compile all of the different tags that got counted out. Um, Typically, production will be shut down during inventory counts because you don't want stuff moving in and out while you're having inventory as well uh, as shipping and receiving because that could skew what you're counting like, oh, wait, I counted that and now it's gone or I was going to count that and it got taken out before I counted it. Um, and then um, they will have instruct instructions to get approval from supervisors and then um, any changes or corrections to inventory amounts will then go back in the audit team and or the client will discuss whether there need to be adjustments to inventory. So they're gonna observe the inventory count. They're gonna do some tests of the pricing and the uh, compilation of the over in overall inventory count by taking all those tags and adding them up. And then they will perform some analytical pre procedures after they've done these recalculations to figure out if there's excessive inventory recorded or if there's slow moving inventory that potentially needs to be revalued. Okay, now part of this process, they do need to make or observe some physical counts of inventory in order to um, have these tests if there is an inventory um, intensive organization. Um, some of the tests they could do at times other than year end. Um, so they could 
look at something just before year end, or they could look at something after year end, or they could do mid year tests and be like, hey, we tested in the middle of the year, it was fine. Um, Typically, again, any time that that goes on, there has to be a stoppage in flow of goods, either in or out of inventory in order to make that accurate. And then they would make the counts from the inventory listing, as well as like looking at the physical inventory. Um, and then they would record in the working papers exactly how and when and what was counted. Okay, so one key aspect of this. So the auditors are going to need to understand exactly how the TAG system and count sheets, et cetera, work. So how is the company tracking their inventory internally? You can't audit it if you don't understand what they're doing. So you're going to need to understand how the systems track things. Are there any delays? Um, is any part of this process done manually or separately outside of the counting system, or does everything they scan automatically get counted? Is there any potential for override? Um, and, and just looking for weaknesses in this particular process. So things to consider, like they mentioned here, hollow squares and empty boxes. So they could have a pallet of boxes and maybe, um, only half of them have stuff in them, or maybe they have a pallet where the boxes are. Let me draw this out here really quick. Oops. Maybe you have a pallet, like say this is what the pallet looks like, you know, and then they have boxes all around the outside, but the inside of the pallet and it's stacked up like, you know, 10 boxes high, looks like a solid pallet of stuff, but in the middle, there's a big hollow space with nothing in it. Um, the Crazy Eddie case, there was definitely some hollow squares and empty box type things going on, as well as some, um, they had, you name it, uh, if they um, had it going on, Crazy Eddie was doing it with their inventory. So it's kind of an interesting case from that standpoint. And actually, when I was in grad school, I did a paper on that fraud. And we were trying to figure out exactly how something happened. And we found Sam Antar, who was the brother and CFO out on social media and sent him an email. And he actually, I was friends with him on Facebook for a while. Um, super interesting guy. If you ever are interested in just hearing um, some commentary on accounting practices and whatnot in the US, find him on Twitter and follow him. Uh, Sam Antar, he's he's got interesting things to say about accounting processes and how frauds occur and whatnot and recognizing frauds that are happening. So interesting guy. Um, so um, touring, shipping and receiving areas, you should get, you know, general lay of the land, watching out for obsolete and slow moving inventory, things that are in transit. And if you aren't, if, if it's too complex for you, consider bringing in inventory specialists to assist with the accounts. It's more expensive for a public accounting firm to do that. But if, if inventory is potentially high risk, that might be something to consider. Uh, most companies that are inventory intensive are going to have some type of technology, either scanners, kind of like what you'd see at the grocery store, RFID, like would be um, ID tags that follow the pallets around uh, for inventory. So like the RFID might actually physically scan as something moves through the system and like recognize, hey, it's no longer physically here. It went physically that way. And now it's in that part of the production cycle. And then drone technology is something that's being used more for certain types of inventory, like farm animals, um, also like stocks of certain types of ore and stuff where you have like large piles, you could go out and, and view different large scale um, types of operations. Now, um, pricing and compilation tests. So um, they need to look at vendor invoices to make sure things are being recorded at appropriate prices. Are prices changing? Are the prices that we recorded this at originally still applicable prices or have things gone down in price? And you're generally going to have the lower of cost or market value. So if things go up in value, you don't make any entries to change that. But if they do go down in value um, permanently, then we would make some adjustments to our inventory costs. And then you're also going to check out um, footing, like so cross footing sideways across columns and vertical footing of any types of spreadsheets or manually kept documents to make sure that they all add up to what they're supposed to and tie to the general ledger. 
Now, as far as presentation and disclosure, um, once you have established uh, and tested all of these different assertions, um, they need to be addressed and properly disclosed. And, and so you would describe some of the processes that were used for tracking in uh, uh, controls over inventory in the footnotes and or internal controls portion of the audit. So you can use the audit risk model to test the assertion of existence and the table below just kind of talks about some procedures that are uh, that are there. If you have low detection risk, for example, uh, meaning a low risk that something will be miscounted and it will go undetected, um, you'd observe the physical inventory count at year end, take a bunch of um, test counts, and then vouch out to inventory purchases, and then you can use some analytical procedures at audit planning and completion. If you have a moderate detection risk, then you would probably also do an interim inventory analysis, and then you would test the change from that time period forward to the year end by saying, hey, this is what sh this is what we had in the middle of the year. We have these for purchases, this for transformation, and this for cost of goods sold. Does that play forward to what we have at the end of the year? And then if there's a high detection risk, then you do a lot more analytical procedures. You're going to observe multiple cycle counts of inventory. And then um, you would rely on roll forward procedures with minimum testing. Okay. Now, um, as far as fraud red flags, uncontrolled physical access to inventory, a lot of high dollar inventory items with, uh, with uh, easy market value, um, easily marketed. Um, if you have unexpected counts during inventory, either too high or too low, both of those are problematic, highly problematic for different reasons. Um, um, if your inventory shows signs of damage, obsolescence, or excess quantities, um, that could potentially mean that, um, you know, problem of controls over tracking of inventory um, and or valuation. Um, and then if there's any in unusual transfers of inventory through the plant during your physical inventory or year end, that could indicate that they're trying to pad inventory in the areas that you're counting, um, that, which is one of the reasons why you would normally want to have everything physically locked down to prevent them from being like, yay, today the inventory is here. We'll see you tomorrow at the next point. Then somebody comes in, fills up a truck, moves it to the next location and unloads it. Then you show up at a different location tomorrow and count that. Um, generally, you'd want to have some way of making it unexpected um, in order to avoid that kind of stuff. And then if the client is reluctant to move merchandise to allow you to inspect things behind, that would potentially be a sign that maybe there's that um, hollow squares and empty boxes problem we talked about. Okay, so... Um, with that, I'm, I'm not going to talk so much about using IDEA, the software, because we weren't able to incorporate that, unfortunately, but um, the last few slides here just talk about some examples of inspection deficiencies that the PCAOB found when they were reviewing some audits. So what are some mistakes that auditors made when they were performing their audits? Well, um, they had... Uh, they had a company, they had all their inventory in one place, and the firm that was performing the audit decided to test a control over the existence of the inventory. So the control required that 80% of the inventory storage locations at this warehouse be counted at least once a year. They didn't evaluate whether it was designed to appropriately address the existence of the inventory, right? So they didn't evaluate um, that only 80% of the inventory had to be counted. So that means that fully 20% of the inventory could have just not been there, right? Or they could be moving it around because if they're testing it at different times and locations, um, that could potentially like leave them wide open to a really significant misstatement if, if only 80% um, is being counted. So um, basically the PCAOB came in and said, hey, this is not adequate. Um, as far as testing of inventory. So the firm designed some substantive procedures 
um, based on a level of control reliance that was not supported. So they said, hey, they, they have good controls. So we're going to have a smaller sample size. We aren't going to do as much testing because they have a great control in place. And then the PCAOB is like, uh, no, they did not have a good control in place. And your reliance on it means that you didn't have a large enough sample size in order to provide the required evidence that there was not material misstatement. Now, um, basically, um, in the next example, they had, um, in order for determining whether there was excess and obsolete inventory, the um, financial statement issuer, they applied different reserve percentages to each of the different categories of inventory. And then the firm did not um, sufficiently test that, that they were all different. So the firm didn't test the completeness of the inventory in each of the categories. So if, if the categories are all being treated separately, then you need to test them all separately. And for one type of inventory, the audit firm did not evaluate whether the reserve percentages were reasonable. So basically they just were like, oh, okay, yeah, you can determine um, what percentage you don't need to test on your own. And, and they did not evaluate whether it was a reasonable percentage. Okay, so these are all from, you notice there's a bunch of different firms here. There's BDO, Deloitte and Touche, or, which is just now Deloitte, it's no longer Deloitte and Touche. Um, KPMG, PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is now PWC. So it, there's not any one firm that gets caught in these PCAOB deficiencies. They all get caught. It's just how much they get caught and when. Because um, people are human, they make mistakes. But um, KPMG has been kind of run through the mill a fair amount over the last couple of years for having lots of um, PCAOB inspection deficiencies. They're sort of like the... Um, they get they get the uh, public flogging quite a bit. Um, there's a website called Going Concern, which is an interesting website, by the way, if you're looking for some insights on the accounting industry. But um, this last example here, they had an issuer that um, their distribution center was subject to daily cycle counts, and they test and the firm decided to test five controls, including performance of the daily counts reviewing of the inventory adjustment report. So you did the count. Did you make the adjustment? Did you review it all monthly to see what those variances were adding up to? And then um, looking at overall monthly write-offs that were proposed, um, as well as monthly reconciliation of the inventory records to make sure that they were tied out to those cycle counts and adjustments. All right, so that's it for chapter nine. Lots of interesting stuff on inventory. The case that we have um, for this week out uh, is the Crazy Eddie case, which was an inventory intensive fraud that occurred. Um, they ended up, it was a sort of family establishment business, and then they ended up um, going public and publicly selling their stock because they got a little greedy. They might have been allowed, uh, they might have successfully um, had their fraud if they had not gone out with an IPO and ended up defrauding a bunch of investors, but that was what they did. So for Wednesday, um, instead of having a live class session, I'm just going to have everybody do the uh, discussion board individually. It's an interesting case to read. So read that for Wednesday. Go ahead and um, answer um, three of the six questions related to um, the Crazy Eddie case. Any questions before we wrap up? Nope. All right, cool. Well, we'll wrap up on this and then everybody have a lovely break. Thank you, you Thanks. too. Thanks, stay safe during the storm as well.